The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So this year the theme for the uh, New Year's celebration is thank you uh, 2019, welcome 2020. So this, this is the, what I'll be talking about in the Dhamma talk, uh, talking about how we uh, can be thankful and how we can welcome things in our lives. And these are, um, as I mentioned, these are core values in Buddhism. There are many core values, but anything that's positive or wholesome is a core value. <laughs> so, with a new year, of course, a new year is a, a convention, but it's a useful convention. And uh, as m many of you will know here uh, from your own experience, we have a number of new years, don't we? I can see here probably at least people who have New Year in Sri Lanka in, when do you have it? In April, April, yeah, so we have it in April in Sri Lanka. And the Chinese New Year? January. When will it be this year? January or February? January. January the 20th, yeah, so we have many New Years. So the idea of a new year is, uh, is something that's in all the cultures, really. And I think it's something that appeals to us because it gives us an idea of starting anew. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Um, starting anew. So it has that benefit, that, uh, um, uh, that, that quality that we can look at it the previous year and then look forward to the next year. Um, and oftentimes people... They take these, uh, we have New Year's resolutions, don't we? We have New Year's resolutions. And <laughs> New Year's resolutions are very interesting, I think, because I don't know how long they last. <laughs> People are going to keep them for the whole year, but they often run out very quickly. And I, I reflected today, because I was talking to somebody about the difference between a resolution, a New Year's resolution. And in Buddhism we have this idea of aditana, and this is determination. And I was reflecting that it's coming from, a, often can come from a very different place. When we have a resolution, it may be coming from I or me doing this, this sense of will. I'm going to give, oh look, look at that, that looks nice. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to give up smoking, I'm going to give up whatever, give up drinking, whatever it is that we're going to give up. And it's often coming from the sense of willpower. Whereas aditana, this determination as we call it in Buddhism, it's one of the paramis, the ten paramis is aditana, this determination, is more like programming the mind. So in other words, it's more like we keep in mind what we're aiming at because we realize in Buddhism the mind is a conditioned phenomena. It's not being driven by I or me, my willpower. But if we can use the power of the mind by keep um, suggesting this aditana, keeping it in mind, then it can become a power. Then the mind can take it on board and then it can take us towards that goal. And that's how we tend to, how I tend to see aditana in the Buddhist practice. And of course this is a great strength because aditana, you know, this ability to determine to do something, to have a goal, and keeping it in mind, uh, is very, gives practice a lot of strength. And it's harnessing the power of the mind. But as I say, it's not coming from I or me, <laughs> me doing it, my willpower this sort of thing. It's coming from the nature of the mind when it has this seed planted within it and we remember it again and again then it can become our reality. So I say in 2020, well now 2019, but soon enough perhaps we should make determinations, aditanas for the years and just keep that in mind but the main thing with determination is that ability to keep it in mind, not to forget it. Because this is the problem usually with resolutions, they're soon forgotten. And especially if they're coming from a sense of willpower, I'm going to do it, uh, I'm going to give up smoking and whatever. 
And it reminds me, I remember when I was working in libraries, the chief librarian wanted to give up smoking. And what did he do? He didn't make a New Year's resolution. He used the power of the mind. He got hypnotized <laughs> to give up. And it worked. It worked for him. And this is exactly what we're doing in a sense. We're not hypnotizing ourselves. But you, you try, you can do self-hypnotism. But when we have determination, we're keeping that in mind and it's getting deeper and deeper in the mind so that the mind takes it on board. And so this is how we're working with the mind rather than, you know, coming from the sense of will that I'm going to do it my way, as someone famous used to sing. So, but... I was going to talk this evening about these core values of, first of all, thankfulness and also this welcoming, you know, this ability. These are very positive values that we can develop in life. So I'll talk about those. But I was just going to mention a famous uh, cake uh, baking story. Do you remember Ajahn Brahm's cake baking story? I sort of adapted a bit. And in this, there are two people who are making a cake. And they're making cakes. And one of them has all the best ingredients. You know, have fine wholemeal flour. Or maybe it's even um, gluten-free. Is it possible? Yes, gluten-free flour? No, that's, a, that's, that's not possible. Anyway, and the best, you know, dried... Is it really yeah. gluten-free? Yeah, wow, well, maybe it's not wheat, though. Anyway, that's it. So gluten-free flour and wholemeal uh, and uh, brown sugar or probably honey would be better and dried fruit, all this very good ingredients that they're going to bake the cake with and all the, uh, and the state-of-the-art kitchen as well. And then another person doesn't have gluten-free flour. <laughs> they have pretty old flour. <laughs> It's been around for a long time. They have white sugar. And the dried fruit looks like it's, it's uh, been around for a very long time. But the interesting thing with these people baking the cake, they can make their cakes. And who do you think would have the best cake? We usually think the person who had all the good ingredients, the state-of-the-art kitchen, would make the best cake. That's not always the case. Sometimes we find people uh, who've got very poor ingredients with cooking just to turn out some really good food, very tasty food, and uh, in a sense, the better cake. And this story about making cakes is a bit like how we deal with life. We may have good ingredients in our lives. You know, for instance, we might have good education, good health, come from good, good family, you know, uh, well-off family, uh, good education, as I mentioned. And another person may not have all those benefits. They might, their ingredients for life may not be so good. But it's not necessarily the case that the person that has the good ingredients for life, all the advantages in life, turns out the best, turns out to have a life that's happy, fulfilling, satisfying. So the person who has got the poor ingredients, can sometimes uh, come up with a very fulfilling life, a very happy life, a very successful life, even though they haven't got the education, even though they haven't come from a, a well-off background. And so this is very much pointing to, you know, the way we regard our life, and the way we um, deal with our life. And uh, so this is... And we can see this sometimes, you know, with people who are in very difficult situations, you know, like uh, I often mention, a man in Perth who's had a stroke. And when I go and visit him, I can't believe it. He looks radiant. He looks very happy. He's a, he's a meditator, so that does help. <laughs> but this is incredible because the ingredients of his life at this moment, not very good. And yet, you know, he looks very happy. And uh, I'm sure it's not just because I've come, he's got a visitor. And so it really points to the way we're relating to our experience, not the, to our lives. It's not actually the things we have in our lives, the material things we have in our lives, but the way we're re relating to it. Are we relating to it in a very positive way 
or are we relating to it in a negative way? So somebody with all the good ingredients, they can be relating to it in a negative way. In Ajahn Brahm's story, you know, you can say, you know, a person like that's got everything, and yet they may, their life may turn out to be, uh, end up with taking drugs and, uh, and in the very unhappy experience of life. Whereas somebody who hasn't got all the good ingredients in life, um, maybe their life turns out to be much happier and more successful because of their attitude. So this is what we can work on. And where does the attitude come from? From the mind, our minds, developing our minds. And so this is um, really the area of that the Buddha was interested in, developing our minds, developing them in positive ways. Unfortunately, most people are quite good, we're quite good at developing them in negative ways. And so this is what the whole path of Buddhism is for, really, is letting go of those negative ways that we have been uh, developing the mind. People, as I often mention, don't realize, and the Buddha mentions this actually in the uh, two types of thought sutta, that by developing, say for instance, negative states of mind, we let go of, we abandon, give up positive states of mind. And when we develop uh, positive states of mind, we let go of, we abandon negative states of mind. This seems very simple, but most people don't realize that they're actually cultivating, they're actually reinforcing these negative or positive states of mind by repeating them again and again until they become quite good at it. <laughs> so we meet people who are very good at becoming angry, and we also meet people who are very good at loving kindness. They are very kind people, very generous, open people. So, as I often say to people, it's up to us what we develop, how we relate to life. Do we relate to it in a positive way or a negative way? And so this is something that's good to for us all to reflect on how are we relating to life, especially at the time of a new year, you know, when we're going from 2019 to 2020. What attitudes are we bringing to it? Are we, are we looking forward to the new year? Or are we going to welcome the new year? Or uh, is there fear in the, in the mind, you know, anxiety? Uh, about what will come in, in the new year. Because uh, oftentimes people can start the new year with that in mind, this negativity. But if we have this attitude of welcoming what we experience, it's a completely different way of relating to our life and the experiences that we encounter. It's Welcoming life is like having a feeling of friendliness and openness to what we're experiencing, having this sort of joy and acceptance for what we're experiencing. So this is a way that uh, I, like, I like very much and I use in a, a meditation too, to just have, because when we have this sense of welcoming, you can imagine, you know, if someone's coming to your door, someone that comes to your home, you open the door and you're welcoming them in, a warm welcome, presumably a friend. <laughs> and uh, the feeling that comes with that. And this feeling is a, uh, a way we can uh, welcome life uh, and we can welcome the new year, 2020, this way. <coughs> And I was going to ask, what is this, do people recognize this feeling of welcoming? Anybody got any ideas? I've done a meditation on this before actually. In the Buddha's teaching. Wow. Huh? Uh, do you recognize what sort of emotion is welcoming? You know, do you know in the Buddha's teaching what sort of uh, um, quality this would be. Metta? Metta, it is, yeah, it is. It's just metta, really, that openness, that friendliness. 
uh, rather than coming from, you know, suspicion or fear, those sorts of things, or anger, uh, or a feeling of maybe injustice. This can be uh, any of these negative states of mind. And this loving kindness, of course, is very effective for cutting across uh, all negative states of mind and includes this, as I say, this welcoming, uh, in a sense, embracing whatever we're experiencing uh, in life. So it's, very, it's a very useful and very pleasant emotion to have. Loving kindness cuts through a lot of our problems and uh, I make a lot of it because one of my teachers, Ayakema, do people know who Ayakema was? German nun who uh, ordained in Sri Lanka. She was quite famous, a famous nun. But she really, you know, used to emphasize loving kindness uh, to develop it as much as possible. But particularly before each meditation, you know, just the first few minutes of the meditation to do some loving kindness because then it really opens, it really reduces the negative qualities in the mind and really opens the mind up into a more positive state. And this, of course, is not only good for meditation, but good for life. And I found for my own practice, especially when I met Ayakema, that was very helpful for my meditation and for my life. Uh, this uh, metta, this loving kindness, in similar Maitri, in Maitri, it's actually Sanskrit. And this sense of welcoming can be difficult because uh, what what uh, the opposite that comes up for us, you know, when we face a new year is, of course, uncertainty, isn't it? This is uncertainty. We're not sure how the new year will be. And, of course, this is what we call in Buddhism impermanent change. And we're all challenged by change, you know. We're all challenged by, and, and this, to a certain extent, this insecurity can come up because we don't know for sure what is coming in 2020. But if we have this attitude of welcoming whatever comes, that's a much more positive way, a much more positive experience for all of us to uh, welcome whatever we're experiencing here in the present moment, what's come our way. And it's very easy to welcome things when they're positive. But it's pretty hard when they're, they're, they're unpleasant. You know, for like that man, for instance, I mentioned, Hugh, who had the stroke in Perth. That's definitely unwelcome. And somebody just mentioned to me the other day a lovely title of a book by Pema Children, Welcoming the Unwelcome. Wow. <laughs> and that's a difficult practice. That's a difficult practice. But in the end, you realise that if one doesn't welcome the unwelcome, if one doesn't have this acceptance, this kindness, softness about the unwelcome, it's double dukkha, it's, we call double suffering, you know, because we have this unwelcome visitor to our lives, whether it be a situation, an experience, change in our relationships, change in job, or whatever has happened. And on top of that, we're negative about it as well. So we have double the suffering that we would have and um, if we can welcome it, we halve it. Things are bad enough. And so if we have, can welcome it, we can be positive about it. When I say positive, you know, when it's unpleasant, it's just being open to it, accepting it, um, being friendly to ourselves particularly, because we're the ones that have to deal with uh, the unwelcome visitors we have. So if we can welcome the unwelcome, that's good practice. <laughs> And the other, um, the other aspect that I was going to talk about uh, this evening too, probably more actually, is about gratitude. And this is really, I mean, we all are aware of it, but I think it's something we can develop so much more, and the Buddha encouraged us to develop it. It's dwelling on the good things we have received from life and others, from life and others. Oftentimes we don't. We sometimes feel like life owes us more. <laughs> We're not getting enough. It should be better than this. But when we actually look at what we have in life, 
it gives rise to this feeling of thankfulness or gratitude and it gives rise to happiness too for us. So I'd like to, because it's getting, we need a bit of uh, interaction now. After, after those icebreaker games, we need more interaction. <laughs> so I'd like you to just to close your eyes maybe and think of three things which you are currently thankful for, three things. Right, so, good. And now I'd like you just to, this is the opposite, think of three things that could be improved or better. Now, I'd like to have the feedback. Which was easier? What, what came quicker? What came quicker? Was it the three things you were grateful for, thankful for? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? That's very good. And other people? Was it always that? Or was it the... Improve? Ah. The three things to improve? Yes. That's what I would generally predict, that most people would uh, find it quicker, easier, I have found it in the past at least, thinking of three things that we needed to improve in ourselves uh, or improve in life. Well, I'm, I'm very impressed. This is a sadhu sadhu. There's so many people who, who got the positive before they got the negative. Did, that's easy. Yeah, that's easy. It's interesting because I gave a talk on Sunday about the Buddha's um, uh, management plan for thinking, for thinking. And someone, Langdon actually, he said that uh, somehow the psychologists or psychiatrists had been able to work out a percentage of people's thinking during the day, the number of thoughts. I don't know how they'd do this, but he said 80% of their thinking was negative. 80%. <laughs> Horrific, isn't it, really? And he said that uh, they found that 97% of the thoughts that occurred in any one day were old thoughts. So 3% were new. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So I think congratulations. You've, been, you've definitely been coming to the Buddha Center for a while. That's good. <laughs> one of the things I'm grateful, grateful. grateful for. Yeah, no, that's good. Because one it shows... Yeah. That's right, yeah. and grateful for being here on an evening like this evening, actually. Improving so. was harder. Sorry? Improving was harder. Wow, that's good. Very good. Very good online. Great. Because I think usually, often it's the other way around, actually, because the, um, the quality of the mind that we call tanha, wanting, is often wanting to, to get something in order to be happy, to improve, to, to make things as they should be. This is the idea of it. And the biggest thing we want to improve on usually is ourselves. <laughs> so, so very good. I think I'm very, very pleased actually. That's very good. And this is, uh, this, this is when we are face, uh, focusing on um, gratitude, thankfulness, is what others have given to us, what life has given to us. And the other aspect of that is giving. They fit together very, very neatly. And these can be very um, positive um, experiences in our lives. When we give, it's a, a cause for happiness and success, actually, can be a, a condition for happiness and success, which is why the Buddha it really encourages dana. You've heard of this word dana, generosity, and it's not only uh, feeding monks and nuns, bringing food, giving robes, giving um, accommodation, and giving medicines. Not only that, because it's all the things we give in life to each other, and 
when we give with that sense of it being a gift, it can really uh, develop the spiritual quality of giving, of generosity, openness. And it's the same with receiving. Often we're not so good at receiving actually. When we receive, we can be grateful, we can be thankful. We're not always. Sometimes people feel awkward or embarrassed when they <laughs> receive. Or they may think, this is not what I wanted. I'm sure Christmas, uh, Christmas time has been, oh my goodness, it's a wrong colour, it's a wrong model, it's all these things. And this is not a good way to receive, actually. But oftentimes we have quite a bit of difficulty receiving. A giving is much, much more simple for us. It's more wholehearted, actually. But receiving, when we're getting things, the, the negative states of mind can come up much stronger, much easier than uh, with giving. So in, in the West we're often focused on the gift rather than what, where we're coming from. So the gift it has to be something that the person needs or wants uh, and we think of that rather than where we're coming from. And in the Buddha's teaching, of course, Paramount is our mind, where we're coming from. And they call it intention in, in Buddhism. This is our intention, where we're coming from. If it's a good intention, is it a joyful one? And you know, for instance, when we give in, um, when we're giving in Buddhism, and when we're receiving as monks and nuns, we receive a lot. We rely on people to support us. And one, one monk in Thailand, an English monk, he says, monks and nuns, they give by receiving. They give the opportunity for others to give. So this is, this is quite a nice thing to say. So, but when we uh, receive and when we give, if we give with a very good mind, you know, a joyful mind, appreciative mind, a thankful mind when we're receiving things. This is a very... Um, it makes, makes us happy, it leads to happiness for us and also for the, uh, for the person who's giving. So they, they will be um, pleased and th this is something that uh, um, will be for their happiness and well-being too. Though I always say when we give, you know, we should give wholeheartedly, not expecting the other person to say, thank you. Because sometimes they don't say thank you or, or, you know, this is just what I needed. They may not say that. But if we give with a good heart, that's enough. If we make it contingent, depend on the other person's reaction, then it, the giving may be you know, um, not as positive. We may be disappointed that the person's not enthusiastic about or happy with what they received. So. Really, uh, when we receive, often we have this saying in English um, that it's not, uh, the gift is not that important, it's the thought that counts. We say the thought that counts. And that is actually very Buddhist, very Buddhist. So, does anybody know, I think most people know what gratitude is, thankfulness is, what it feels like, yes. So, other words for it, and it's, it's good to have an idea of other, other words for it, is appreciation is good, because when we appreciate other, <coughs> pe other people, <clears throat> this is a, a form of gratitude. When we appreciate things that have been done for us, what we've received from life, thankful. Another one I like is counting our blessings. You know, when we, because oftentimes we don't count our blessings. We're looking at life uh, from the view of what could be better, what's missing in my life. This is, this is what uh, this wanting, the cause of unsatisfactoriness that the Buddha talks about in the Second Noble Truth is all about this wanting. Things could be better, they could be improved upon, which is why most people, then when you ask them what was easier, you know, being thankful or thinking of what needs to be improved, that comes very naturally. Because we all have this idea of what's missing, what will make us happy. And I call this never, never happiness, because it's always in the future. We'll be happy when we get this, when we get that, when we get this job, when we get the new partner, when we get the new phone, whatever it is. 
But the happiness that comes from here and now, just realizing what we have, is available to all of us. And it leads to the sense of contentment. That yes, oh, what I've got is pretty good. And uh, so the meditation later this evening will focus on this. And, oh, what time are we? 8.30, isn't it? Oh, yes, right over. The meditation that I'll, I'll uh, do a guided meditation later, that's at 11, be a good time. I'm sure many people will be very sleepy by that time. We'll be on the theme of I'm so lucky. This is my uh, one of my phrases that I use for thankfulness, for gratitude. I'm so lucky. That sense of, you know, that there are so many positives in my life, so many things often we take for granted, we overlook. And I get to a story in a minute, actually. <laughs> So I'm so lucky is actually very, it's very interesting in, in life. We realize, and this is true for positive and negative states of mind, we're often running on mantras. We're running on mantras. The negative states of mind, you know, for instance, the opposite of being thankful is, is not good enough. I deserve more, you know. And oftentimes we're not aware of this mantra that we're running and, and not aware of the result that it's having on our minds, which is, you know, feeling like we're being shortchanged by life. Life's not giving us what we want. We should have more, you know, and all of this, rather than you know, the, this, this mantra that I like to use, I'm so lucky, which is looking at the positives in our lives. Sometimes people can use that mantra, I'm so lucky, and they'll start thinking of all the negative things. And I think that's good to see too, because it actually tells us what state our mind is in and gives us an indicator that the mantra we're running on is a negative one. Uh, and we may be able to realize what that is, you know. This is not fair, you know, I'm being shortchanged by life or whatever. But when we use I'm so lucky, for me that's very positive, but other people may find it brings up this what do they mean? I'm so lucky. <laughs> what about? You know, so on and so forth. So this uh, gratitude uh, or thankfulness is also um, very good for dealing with any of the negative states of mind, the fault-finding states of mind that come up, as is the uh, metta, the loving-kindness. And now I will tell you a story, uh, a Nasrudin story. I had a complaint, I think, not last time, but the time before, that there was no Nasruddin story. So I have a Nasruddin story about, and I'll, I'll tell you what it's about afterwards. In this story, Nasruddin met a traveler on the road, and this traveler said he was really bored with life. And he, he, uh, he said, nothing interests me in life. I'm bored, I don't have to work, so he's got enough money to, to exist, and he said, but I'm just traveling just for something to do, you know, it's, it's more interesting than, than my life. And, uh, and he, so he was traveling. So Nasruddin was listening to this man going on about how boring life was and, and how uneventful and so forth. And quickly, he grabbed the traveler's bag and he rushed off into the bush and ran through the bush further down the road, cut a few corners off going through the bush. And the traveler was really upset. He was really distraught. His bag with everything in it, his money and whatever he, he needed to live on, had gone. He was really upset. He was really depressed. And he's walking along the road. It's a wonder he didn't chase after Nasrudin. <laughs> didn't think he'd do that, really. But he's walking along the road. And Nasrudin had got ahead of him further down the road. And he put the bag on the road. And then the man eventually is really despondent, depressed, thinking, oh, God, you can't travel, trust anyone these days, you know. And he gets to the, the, comes around the bend, there's the bag. And he's so happy, he's overjoyed. Ah, my bag. And then Nasruddin pops out of the bush, comes out of the bush and says, still bored? <laughs> <laughs> and of course he wasn't, because he... When we're bored, we're taking life for granted, aren't we? And that man was very much taking life for granted and things for granted. But 
this story teaches us a very, a very important uh, thing about uh, life and about gratitude. That when someone or something is not there, then we start to be thankful. Often, very well. Often, it can be we can be thankful. Then we can become grateful. We can become appreciative. And it's good to do this while people are alive. It's best to do it before they die or something like that. And then we become grateful. Then we miss them. And oftentimes you find this. This is a great thing for uh, relationships when, uh, when for whatever reason, partners are separated. You know, maybe business. One goes on business. The other one stays home or whatever. Or goes on, you know, don't go on holiday separately. That's pretty modern. <laughs> but... But you really notice, you appreciate each other when you, when you come back together because that taking for granted, when we live together, when we're, we're always together, we can easily take each other for granted, you know, whatever the situation be. And so this, when we're separated from people, from situations, we actually get uh, a greater appreciation. We realise how important that person is to our lives. And as I say, it's much better to do this, to wake up to this when the person is alive, not wait until they die and then realise, oh my goodness, you know, how much one uh, really appreciated them. And we didn't say it. We didn't say it to them. So that's one thing that uh, actually um, increases gratitude when we have this separation. And it's a good, sometimes it's a good exercise just to think, you know, of somebody who you're very close to, that they've gone away, and see what emotion comes up. You know, because in your mind they've, they've gone away, and then you can see this appreciation can come up, this gratitude can come up. The other thing that uh, can come up, this is a good story too, or it's a good joke, <laughs> that, that makes uh, gratitude difficult for people, and this is actually part of wanting things to be different, really. It's another way of saying it. This is tanha in Buddhist speak. It's the second noble truth where we say the cause of our difficulties, our problems in life, is wanting or expectation. There's another word for wanting, really. And so when we expect life or others uh, to be the way we want, we won't be grateful because then they're just the way they are. When people don't live up to our expectations, we are really disappointed with them and we feel we deserve more. So, I give this story is quite a good example of it. It's actually a joke. Uh, two old friends met. One looked glum and the other asked, what's the problem? This is Dukkha, <laughs> second noble truth or first noble truth. He said, three weeks ago, my uncle died, leaving me $50,000. Not bad. Two weeks ago, my cousin died and left me $100,000. Last week, my grandmother died and left me half a million dollars. Not bad. And then the friend said, well, then what's the problem? And he said, this week, there hasn't been anything. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... This is how expectation, you know, really pulls gratitude or destroys gratitude, this sense of thankfulness. Because he's got a lot of money in the last three weeks, just this week, he didn't. But it points to what the Buddha, uh, oh, actually, I've got to finish off soon. Are we running to time? Yes, all right. The Buddha said that there are two people that are rare in this world. One is a grateful or a thankful person, and the second one is a person who does something for us without being asked. Unasked, they do this. So these are two rare people. So let us be, I think there's a few rare people here actually, that's very good. Let us be grateful people and be this, uh, and enjoy when we're grateful for life, it brings happiness to us actually. And it's not this constant feeling of, oh, we could be improved, we could get more, we, we deserve more. But if we're grateful for life, for the body and mind we have, that's something that we can use for our life. Our body is a vehicle and our mind is what we, how we experience life. So we, these things we can be grateful for. And in terms of the Buddha's path, they allow us 
to practice the Buddhist path and develop happiness. And there are so many things we can be grateful for. And of course, you know, having enough to eat, having enough to wear, having somewhere to live, having medicine, all these things are important. And one of the things I was going to mention too, sometimes people, uh, you can see how in our society these things become big things. They become things that develop into, it's not a simple house, we need a mansion. Not simple clothes, we need lots of fancy clothes. And it, rem it reminds me of this saying is, don't try to keep up with the Joneses, drag them down to your level. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible really. <laughs> But those things are all very well to be thankful for, but our relationships are probably the things that we should uh, most you know, develop this thankfulness for. And as I say, when the people in our lives, the important people in our lives are not there, then this thankfulness comes up for us. Also thankful to our parents and also for the teachings, you know, like the, the Buddhist teachings that we have. They are an amazing gift that without which most people, most of us would feel like we're in the dark. And these teachers, you know, like the Buddha, the Buddha's teaching, they give us the most important thing in life. They give us a sense of purpose and meaning in life. They give us an understanding of what life is about, making sense of it. And that's, very, that's really one of the most important things. So, let's see now, it's time to finish. So this year, just to finish off, it's good if we can be thankful for what we what 2019 has been like. Some of the and we have an exercise just now, I think, about that. You know what we're thankful for in 2019. But also what we're welcoming in 2020. Of course, we don't know exactly what we're welcoming. <laughs> and this is, this is part of the being open to, to uh, what is coming. And the main purpose for developing, you know, thankfulness, gratitude, is happiness. It will bring happiness to us. It brings a very positive mind state, a mind state that is not complaining about the imperfections that we experience in life. We're focusing on the things that are, you know, that we feel are real gifts to us. And as I say, and one of the things uh, I, li I liked, I saw a signboard, when I go on the arms round, I saw a signboard down, one of the shops down the road, and it said, imperfection is beautiful. Now that's really positive. <laughs> Very positive. And I thought, well, can, can can we say that is, is, is something. And, and also I did reflect, would you shop in, would you go to shop in that shop? <laughs> so that's quite a, quite a good thing, yeah. So when we practice this uh, gratefulness, we get a greater sense of connection with each other. We reduce our selfishness. And it's a very useful thing for hard times. You know, when we, when the mind, when situations get very difficult, it's a way we can welcome the unwelcome, actually, is by being, counting the blessings in our lives. And they always are at any given time. Even at difficult times, there's always blessings. So I'd like to finish there. And uh, hopefully we can be thankful, thank you 2019 and welcome 2020. So thank you for that. <laughs>